Ang kwetyo. Ang nung nung rehap kaham to kay jam na kan ni ti sam na ka ai nung pa daw witika chun te dom nang thap ni nya dam bai min ok ka nung ka mon to ka tang sam ruot ni dao chu pu sa sai still header som chu Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. Heather, before I ask you questions about the document you have in your hand, I want to just clear up something from the last document. So it was the same file, file to tab one. Page 28. is again E3 slash 1714. I read out part of an extract and you said it needed to be read in the context of the whole paragraph. And so after the words, among those evacuees, the former Lon Nol soldiers, especially the officers, were to be considered enemies, it goes on to state among soldiers, only those responsible for lots of killing were supposed to be considered enemies. Other than ministers, civil servants were not supposed to be considered enemies. Can you confirm that that was what you were told in this interview? Can you confirm that that was what you were told in this interview? Yes. I'd like now to move on to the document you had in your hand, which is the one that you were considering over the break. This was document E3 slash 390, and it's the one that I think you took out with you. Can you confirm that you have that? And my first question is, we obviously have a name on the document. Um, this is file to tab six. From, from reading the statement, are you able to help us as to whether the name that we have on the document is the correct name or if it is somebody else? Um, I'm, I've read, glanced through the, the whole document and yes, I think it's the person named at the top on the first page. Mr. President, there is no pseudonym for this person, and with your permission, can I please refer to this person by name? Thank you, Mr. President. The name we have is Matt Lee. Now, can I take you first of all to page 30? English ERN 0043-6875. Khmer 0039-21016. Through 07. I apologize, I do not appear to have. Oh, I do, in fact. No, I don't have a French ERN, forgive me. This is, I would anticipate, on the last page of the French version. In explaining certainly his, his position at some stage, he says, I was in a district committee and I was a member of the standing committee of the assembly too. Is that what you were told in this interview? Yes. Can I ask you to turn to your page 22? Towards the bottom of the page, or two-thirds, 
a, he, a, a sentence beginning domestic <coughs> policy. Do you have that? I'm now going to read this extract. Domestic policy. Starting from this, it was imperative to dig the trunks out by the roots, dig out both trunks and roots, the city people. They researched those people, and if they had even been first lieutenants, second lieutenants, or had worked in the courts, they were killed. That was what they called to be able to kill them. They designated them all as enemies. They had served the three enemies, first CIA henchmen. By CIA, they meant belonged to the American CIA. Second, the KGB, Soviet agents. Third, the UN. They made these determinations to facilitate the killing. So then the arrested people in your questions, you asked, was there any possibility of preventing this? Well, they arrested people. I was district committee level. I was also a member of the assembly. Just ask them why. They said CIA. Just ask them why. They said UN Major. Just ask why. They said KGB. That was all predetermined. Starting from that came the killing. The continuous killings that began after the liberation in 1975 until we liberated the country in 1979. Can you confirm that that was what you were told in this interview? Yes. It goes on on the same page, next no, sentence, no, no, but I suggest no, that you no. examine the killing. No, no, if they had killed no, just no, the adults no, and the educated, no, and specifically no, people who had been no, soldiers, no, and if those people no, actually had been no, spies, no, we would not say anything. But when they learned about teachers, no, students, no, veteran no, government no, officials, no, Veteran doctors, they killed them all. So I ask, why do so many intellectuals remain? From what I have learned, they all have hidden their personal history. Also, their working methods were superb. Their methods of searching these people out were, <coughs> speak frankly. What do you know? What level? What work? Well, we will send you up an equal position for you and send you back to work. So then Cambodian people are very honest in what they say and write. Writing those personal histories was suicide. But some people were not satisfied and figured it out. They had said that they'd been pedicabbed drivers, workers. Some of them were able to save themselves. Can you confirm that that was what you were told in this interview? Yes. Still on the same interview, page 29, English RN 00436874, Khmer 00392105. I have the French for this page, 00479818. I personally saw the killing. 
Beginning in 1975, when he to Pol Pot, had full power in his hands. That was when it began. Like I said earlier, ask them, and they said CIA, ask them, and they said Lieutenant Colonel, Second Lieutenant, and the Cham brothers and sisters. I am Cham too. They led them away by their necks. They did not let them sit. They did not let them sleep. And they did not let their police and their military sit either. They arrested cadres one after another, the masses, the combatants. Can you confirm that that was what you were told in this interview? Yes. I'd like you to move, please, to file 2, tab 5. Again, not to give the name of this person, but the, it's the first page after tab 5. The English ERN is 00352076. The document number is D224.81. So this is uh, the document. Mr. President, again, no pseudonym. Can I please refer to this person by name? Person is called Riam D. R E A M D I. He states, the northwest zone killed a lot after 17 April 1975. The evacuation of Batambang was not yet complete when the northwest zone cadre began killing people in the evacuation columns. They killed those in the military and civil service with rank. These were taken away and killed. Is that what you were told in this interview? Yes. I'd like you to move back to a document that you had in your hand that we covered earlier. It is for us document number E3-387. This was from TCW-494. If it helps you, the first number in the top left of the page is 0035 TCW494 is written on the first page. Can I take you, please, to page 6, English RN, 00350205, Khmer 00379486, French 00441418.
at the bottom of your page, Mr. In April, and that's reference to 1975 from the preceding paragraph, in April, Pol Pot issued another secret policy. That was wiping out all elements in the Lon Nol regime. With respect to civilian local administrators, they would be purged from sub-district level to upper echelon. Regarding soldiers, they would be swept clean from second lieutenants up to generals. Can you confirm that that was what we were told in this interview? Uh, can I have the Khmer ERN again, please? Oh, here it is. I've got it. Yes, the Khmer ERN 0037-9486. And I would anticipate it's probably towards the bottom of that page. We have it now, it can go on the screen. Sorry to interrupt. We, we have been missing uh, the document that we are speaking about, everybody here. Uh, E3-387. Yes, um, the, the, the English is, could be slightly misread, uh, in my view. Um, the, the term used is sweeping cleanly away, here rendered as wiping out. Unless I'm missing it with my failing eyesight, the, um, the Khmer doesn't actually say all elements in the Lomol regime. It just says elements. Um, the, the way in which it's formulated means that not everybody in the Lomol regime is an element, but certain persons within the Lomol regime are defined as elements, and what follows then gives the definition of those within the regime, among the regime's personnel who are considered elements. So with that proviso, yes. I just want to be absolutely clear on the final sentence that I put, which was regarding soldiers, they would be swept clean from second lieutenants up to generals. Is that a correct interpretation, translation? Yes. The next page is page 7, Khmer ERN 00379488. Again, I'm afraid I don't have the French. Bottom of your page 7. In May 1975, Pol Pot called district level cadres and sector level cadres, military cadres, ranging from battalion level and above throughout the country, to a meeting held at Kampuchea Soviet Technology School. 
where they announced their new policy on the continuation of carrying out socialist revolution. In their policy and the content of the socialist revolution, they determined that we had to struggle to firmly oppose and root out the previous regime based on political consciousness and organizational works. They announced like this because they thought that as long as influences from previous regimes were not yet rooted out in the fields of politics, military, economics, social affairs and consciousness, Socialist revolution would not uphold. They further confirmed where we had to carry out socialist revolution and uproot the previous regime in all fields. They clarified that we had to do it on cadres, state members, and militaries. This was where we did. This was the main policy in the affairs of building their socialism. I hope you have the Khmer on the screen. And again, the same question. Can you confirm that that was what you were told? Is the translation faithful? Um, yes, with two caveats. Uh, first, the word that's rendered here is consciousness. I would translate as ideology. Slightly different. And be absolutely clear, the, the sentence that begins, they clarified. When it talks about cadre, state members and militaries, they mean cadre of the Communist Party, state members of, the, of Democratic Kampuchea, and militaries of the Revolutionary Army of Kampuchea, not ex-Khmer Republic, but within their own ranks. Now again, without giving the name, you know who the person is. Can you help us on what his position was? Um, in the period from 1975 to 1979. Short summary, not life history. Um, for most of that period, he was Deputy Secretary of um, Sector 21 of the East Zone and a member of the Zone Standing Committee. Thank you. We've been on file two so far. Can I please ask you to get file four? File for tab one. Document E190.1.39. Footnotes 20, 21, and 22 on page 7. Speaking here about how far this net was extended, and you talk about extending the execution net to cover most Republican military and police commissioned officers and civil service officials of equivalent rank, brackets, bandasak, close bracket, although not ordinary soldiers. And in support of that, you reference our document E3-79, which is an interview that you had with Ian Suri on the 17th of December 1996. And then for footnote 21, you say the term Bandasak 
refers literally to the Armed Forces and Police Commission Officer Corps. By extension, it was also applied to civil servants who in the pre-communist Cambodia wore uniforms with insignia that reflected their rank within the administrative hierarchy and also the two cadre notebooks that we've already covered. With this additional comment, this decision reflected an official evaluation that of all the separate class types, Republican Army and Police Forces were on the whole absolutely reactionary, although not all were, and you also reference uh, Ben Kiernan. I just wanted to ask about Bandasak, and you speak about the civil servants who in pre-communist Cambodia war, I think, uniforms with insignia. Can you just explain that a little bit more, please? That's based on my recollection of what I saw when I was in Cambodia during the Khmer Republic period. Thank you. Um, we're moving now to file four, so the same file, but tab four. This is document number E3 slash 48. Uh, seven candidates for prosecution. If you can go please to page 35. I hope that's the first page you have. I can give the English ERN 00393521, no French or Khmer on the list for translation. It's actually on footnote 117 at the bottom of, of the page. Uh, the security services and CHLOP operated in a social setting in which the population as a whole was officially divided into three categories called Pen Set, Full Rights, Triam Candidate, and Panahau Depositee. This system combined a definition of their rights as members of cooperatives with a vocabulary for labeling people in terms of their perceived or potential disloyalty to the revolution. Those consigned to the lowest category were subject not only to discrimination in terms of political rights and economic rewards, but also arbitrary execution. Thus, in the first phases of the DK regime, generally speaking, the full rights group received the full theoretical food ration or more, had the right to join any political organization, including the party and the army, and to hold any political position. The candidate group was second on rations and distribution lists and had rights to hold certain low-ranking political positions. The depositees were last on the distribution lists, first on execution lists and had no political rights. You reference 
a work of your own, Steve Hedder, Campuchia, Occupation and Resistance, to in 1980. And then another reference is in these terms in a commentary. In the second half of 1978, this tripartite division was officially abolished, but elided into what Pol Pot referred to more prosaically as a distinction between good, medium and weak elements among the population and within the party. And that references Pol Pot, let us continue to firmly hold aloft the banner of victory of the glorious Communist Party of Kampuchea in order to defend democratic Kampuchea, carry on socialist revolution and build up socialist revolution, sorry, build up socialism, 27th of September 1978. You carry on informally, both within party circles and at the mass level. This tripartite division tended to be reduced to a simple dichotomy between veteran and new people that categorized the population on the basis of whether they had come under communist control before or after 1975. From the beginning, Although the leadership made a clear distinction between being a depositee or one of the new people and being a politically bad element, local security services were given to understand that the new people contained a high proportion of no good elements. And you also refer our document E3-216 and our document E3 7 is a record of, record of the Standing Committee Tour of the North West Zone, 20 to 24 August 1975. And in respect of that or explaining that document, you say, according to which an unnamed representative of the standing committee told the zone that every type of horrible element exists among the new people. And E3737, sorry, E3797 is a minute of the meetings of secretaries and deputy secretaries of divisions and independent regiments on the 18th of August 1976. My question to you is, ultimately, is it right that there were two groups, as you say, the, the new people, and how would you describe the other element? Mr. President, I would like to go on record as saying that this is starting to be a travesty. I mean, what are we doing? We're, we're reading from a, a book called Seven Candidates for Prosecution and Accountability for the Crimes of the Khmer Rouge. This witness is started afterwards working for the prosecution and then for the investigating judges. He's been read a whole passage from a book from a footnote and then asked a question about the groups. This has absolutely nothing to do with uh, 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 proper ascertaining the truth. Uh, Please let's stop this charade. Well, you, you've already ruled, Mr. President. But again, based on the interviews you've had with people during this period, as to the distinction between new people, old people, is this a theme that has come up directly in your interviews.
Um, yes, and not only with regard to the period from April 1975 and thereafter, uh, but before that, um, into the early 70s, because as the footnote tries to explain, and this is a somewhat informal categorization of the population. So even before April 1975, if people were newly liberated, to use the party terminology, um, or newly arrived by whatever method into the liberated zones, to use the party terminology, they were referred to as new people in contradistinction to those who had already been in the liberated zones prior to that time. So that practice, that informal uh, colloquial practice of differentiating between those who were already, had already experienced the revolution and those who were just arriving as a result of whatever method was already in, 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 in party talk uh, from before 75 and, and it continued thereafter. I'm given the objection. Can you please confirm that what you've just said is based on your interviews and not some opinion or some speculation? Uh, I, I would describe it as a summary of what I have learned from interviews and from documents. Now, file four, but back to tab one. Document. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Je crois qu'avec la dernière réponse qui a été faite par euh, M. Eder, nous nous rapprochons euh, de la description qui vient d'être donnée par mon confrère, à savoir que <coughs> cette audience finalement ressemble beaucoup à celle que nous avons déjà beaucoup contestée sur les documents clés. Monsieur a fait des milliers de kilomètres pour venir devant ce tribunal. Le procureur lui lit des passages qui l'intéressent pour sa thèse de ses ouvrages. Et puis, comme toute confirmation de ce qui est dit, on lui demande, via des questions très générales, si tout cela confirme de façon générale les interviews sans plus de précision qu'il a eues euh, on ne sait pas avec qui, on ne sait pas quand. Alors nous, quand notre tour viendra euh, d'interroger M. Eder, euh, qu'allons-nous faire Allons-nous stupidement poser des questions identiques euh, à M. Eder en lui demandant si... Euh, euh, de manière générale, euh, euh, il a aussi entendu le contraire de ce qu'il a dit. Euh, nous travaillons à l'instant sur des bases qui sont tellement incertaines, qui sont tellement peu précisées, que euh, l'exercice paraît effectivement vide de sens. Et je rejoins en tout point ce qu'a dit mon confrère Victor Copé à l'instant. If my learned friend wants me to give him some lessons on cross-examination, he's free to cross-examine on whatever he wants to cross-examine. Whether he's got a strategy, I don't yet know. But he must cross-examine as he thinks best on the same material, which is the books authored by Mr. Hedder. It's no objection. There never has been from the defense to Mr. Hedder giving evidence. This has got nothing to do with document hearings. Uh, Can I please continue? 
Reassessing the senior leaders. In reference to the new people. Footnote 44, page 10. As types who had lived an easy life before, they were less politically dependable than the poor basic people and more liable to become involved in the traitorous activities of covert Cambodian kin, a colloquial Khmer word of Vietnamese derivation, originally meaning secret police agents who were stubbornly trying to overthrow the revolution, supposedly at the behest of the CIA and other foreign intelligence agencies. And the document you reference is document number three. In relation to this, um, this is E3-781. And in terms of the, the colloquial word of Vietnamese derivation, did you have to research that or was that apparent from the wording itself? Um, it always struck me as an odd looking word in Khmer. So I looked in Vietnamese dictionaries and discovered Vietnamese Navy speakers and said that it came from Vietnamese and indeed there is a term in Vietnamese, a term with two elements of which this is one which has that meaning. Thank you. In the same document, it's the next footnote, in fact, footnote 45, so E190.1.398, reassessing the senior leaders. Indeed, because their transformation was just beginning, they remained leading carriers of imperialist, feudalist, capitalist outputs, stances, ideologies, worldviews, and credos, who would try to disseminate their remnant crop and evil influences among the veteran people and the revolutionary ranks. And to reference our document E3-729, in the new current phase of the revolution, our youth must constantly strengthen their stance of absolute and seething class struggle in revolutionary youth. Number 10. October 1975. Remnant crud is quite a difficult potential English word, but what is the Khmer for remnant crud, or how do we get to remnant crud? I'll, 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 I'll reveal that my claim to be fluent in Khmer is completely baseless. Um, I think the original Khmer term is Gamal Cha. And from Al Jah, to my understanding, uh, refers to the, the, the skin in which dirt uh, is impregnated that you have to sort of scrub, scrub off if you want to get rid of the dirtiness. Um, so that's a, a term that was used by in NCPK parlance to refer to the dirty remnants of the old society that have to be, in some sense, by some method scrubbed away. I'd like you to stay within the same footnote. 
uh, same document rather, E190.1.398, reassessing uh, senior leaders, uh, footnote 82, this is on your page 16. Uh, The English RN 000067 were tasked uh, to continue the work begun by military units in and around Phnom Penh and other towns uh, by finding and then secretly killing all fugitive bandasak. This assignment seems to have been pursued in most places with ruthless thoroughness, if not always the required discretion. And one of the references in support was, uh, for example, the evidence to this effect for the North Zone in North Zone Committee to receive evacuated people, identity card dated 26 April and stamped by Sector 43. We don't have that on our case yeah. file. Uh, Can you help at all with that footnote, please? please? Um, thank you, Chairman. If I recall correctly, after I left Cambodia in April 75, um, I talked to some people who had just come out of Cambodia, including those who managed to make their way to the Thai border. Um, and one of those people gave me a copy, or gave me the original of that, of that document, of which I made a copy. Thank you. Um, I'm dealing now with footnotes within the same document, E190.1.398, reassessing the senior leaders. It's actually two footnotes that are close. They're both on page 11. It's footnote 57 and footnote 59. I'd like to read them together because the sources are the same. About the the killings. Uh, justifying this position by <laughs> arguing that such executions <laughs> were a necessary part <laughs> of attacking <laughs> the old social <laughs> regime. Uh, that is a reference on footnote 57 to the Kai Polk interview. <laughs> and then if we read footnote 59 in terms of the text, without further definition, uh, Pol Pot also told the political and military cadre in attendance a meeting that they must carry out a dogged struggle against CIA spies belonging to Americans and KGB spies belonging to the Soviets. Now, one of the references for footnote 59 is E2-2782 on our case file, which is the Kai Pok autobiography. Now, you've already covered the Kai Pok interview that you had with him, but again, from your direct knowledge, do you know about the Kai Pok autobiography? Have you seen that document? Um, I think this is another document that was um, put together by Cam Nguyen, who I talked about previously, um, who either had Gapo write this document for him or took it down as a result of an interview that he did with Gapo and the 
that that text um, was then given to a number of people, um, including, if I recall correctly, the then editor of the Phnom Penh Post, Michael Hayes, uh, who in turn passed it on to me. I think that's the chain of custody for that particular document. Thank you. Uh, still within reassessing senior leaders, E190.1.398. I'm combining two footnotes. They're on page 20, footnote 103 and footnote 104. Dealing with footnote 103 first. According to the formal procedure, the cooperative chairman then decided whether the person was to be subjected to re-education locally or be reported to the district party committee person in charge of security for investigation. On the basis of the results of this investigation, the district was supposed to seek a decision from the sector about whether the person should be executed, kept in prison, or released. Now, you reference here a U.S. Embassy document, Democratic Cambodia Prison System. Can you please, again, the source, how you obtained it? Um, that one, I think, came to me from someone who was in the U.S. Embassy in Bangkok at the time that the, 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 on, at the time the document was, was, was drafted, or possibly from somebody in the U.S. State Department who received it in Washington. Um, there are a couple of possibilities here. One is uh, Charles Twining, uh, another is um, Tim Carney, another is to say Anderson. Anderson. I don't remember which of these people it might have been, but it was probably one of those three. So it's an internal, it, it's, it's one of these things that, that used to be called an airgram. It's, a, it's an embassy report that ends up in Washington. And again, talking about this procedure and carrying on, you say, and formally speaking, the sector needed the approval of the Zone Standing Committee to proceed with the killing. And you then reference our document E3-12, which was the 30th of March 1976 meeting of the Central Committee. And you say this was in line with the March 1976 CPK Central Committee decision, according to which the right to decide on smashing within and outside the ranks of the party should be exercised in the grassroots by each zone standing committee. And my question is this, and I'm using the exact same wording that I used to a previous question, and this is about the procedure in terms of district supposed to seek a decision from the sector, sector needing the approval of the zone standing committee to proceed with the killing. From your interviews and direct contact you had with interviewees, did you gather any information that this procedure had in fact happened? Again, to, to summarize, my overall impression is that practice in general did not follow this formal procedure, um, that it was relatively rarely the case that the decision 
ហើយនៅក្នុងឯកសារអ៊ីមនុស្សកាលសិបប្រំបីញូពីពលទេស្តមនីសកនហើយនៅក្នុងឯកសារអ៊ីមនុស្សកាលសិបប្រំបីញូ
and all other monks deconcentrated by being dispersed from pagodas in Phnom Penh and towns in the countryside in such a way as to preclude any collective action against the new regime. In line with its elaboration of the notion that monks were one of the special class types, the CPK targeted the most senior members of the Buddhist clergy for immediate execution, treating them as the equivalent of Bandasak. And your sources in connection with that, or your footnotes refer to, the DK cadre notebooks that you've already covered, and you add uh, the latter notebook specified that most of the Sangha officialdom was under the political influence the highest strata of society. Can you confirm that that was the document that you sourced in order to make that statement in the book? I think there may be some stretch here um, in the sense that I'm not absolutely sure that everything that's in the sentence can be found in those two notebooks, but I would have to look at the notebooks to be sure. Um, again, uh, are there any other sources? Uh, the question is about Buddhist monks, senior Buddhist monks. Um, are you aware of any other sources that can help the court on a particular the CPK targeted the most senior members of the Buddhist clergy for immediate execution? Again, had that come up in any um, interviews, any direct contact you had with interviewees? I think the, the sentence is another example of, uh, of a summary of what I was told by various people. But in this, in this instance, I would defer to people who have done a lot more, subsequently done a lot more research than I have, such as Ian Harris and others who have written extensively on this subject. That's fair. Um, the next footnote is 126, still in 190.1.398, still on the subject of monks, and you talk in the book about separating them out from evacuation columns for smashing. That's the senior ones. On the other hand, lower-ranking monks from the towns were broadly in the same category as other urban evacuees. And you quote there in support E31820, which is François Ponchot's book, Cambodia Year Zero, and I think another, uh, well, uh, the footnote says Chang Song, Buddhism under Pol Pot, 30th of November 1996. Um, it's the Chang Song. Is that an academic book or an article, or can you help? Um, I think that's a should be described as a DC CAM report. And I'm not sure whether it was ever published as such, but it certainly should be available from DC CAM. Thank you. Same file, still in file four, tab four. Seven candidates for prosecution. You need to go to page 37, which I think will be the third page into your pack. English RN 00393523. Thus, from the day of liberation, until the last day of democratic Kampuchea, the security services, assisted by the Chlop and the people, arrested, detained and executed 
wave after wave of alleged counter-revolutionaries and spies they identified in multiple population categories. Beginning in the latter half of 1976, the security services received signals from party leadership that they must augment their efforts to identify former Khmer Republic officials who had escaped execution because no good elements among the population were not merely undesirable but part of a vast anti-communist conspiracy and must therefore urgently be eliminated. The local security forces responded by arresting, interrogating and killing people who fell into these categories. You then uh, reference our document E3-798, which is a minutes of the meetings of secretaries and deputy secretaries of the divisions and independent regiments on the 30th of August 1976. And then you go on to say um, this shift is perhaps most clearly signaled in Son Sen's summing up of enemy situations at a meeting of senior military cadre he convened as General Staff Chairman on the 30th of August 1976. Now, so we're clear, the minutes here, this is in relation isn't it, to, a, to a, a military meeting. Um, yes, it's a meeting of military, but my memory serves, it's a, in the context of that meeting of the military, it's a statement of general party policy applicable beyond the military. The formulation, as I recall it, is such as to indicate that it's not simply to be applied within the military, but as a reflection of a, more, of a broader party policy. My final attempt, my last and final attempt, Mr. President, the reflection of a broader force. I think of ever greater witness who was a ແລະຕາສາສາຍຮູບນີ້ບານແປະ <laughs> I don't mind you saying to Mr. Hedder he's not to express opinion. I think that was said at the start. The question is simply going to a book and going to a footnote. So uh, I would like to proceed. As I say, my questioning is about the book and the footnote. So I will try and do my best to ensure that nothing that Mr. Coppe finds offensive occurs. Thank you. Now you referred
ចាក់ក្រុមពីពលវិរៈជួលលើលោកត្រីចាក្រុមដើម្បីបញ្ជាក់បញ្ហានៃ <coughs> Thank you, President. Uh, uh, the trial chamber does not fully sustain the objection. Uh, the um, previous objections from the non chair defence team have been directed more at the probative value of the uh, uh, testimony or the documents that have been examined and as has been indicated previously, uh, the trial chamber is aware of its obligations to weigh the probative value of material in the each its uh, verdict. This uh, objection was directed more specifically at the difference between uh, a witness's testimony and that of an expert. The chamber asks the prosecutors uh, to recall the uh, direction that uh, made in treating uh, Mr. Hedder as a witness and not as an expert. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. I have two more questions to finish the end of the I'd like to do that now, but I'm in your hands. It's uh, seven candidates for prosecution, E3 stroke 48, that's file four, tab four. It's page 138 and page 139. Footnote 138 and 139. Uh, thus, according to Son Sen, all of the apparently trivial phenomena that hindered the achievement of the party's goals should not be viewed as normal problems of a socialist or other society, but should be dealt with by eliminating the internal enemies who were always endeavouring to attack our revolution. You refer to our document E3-804, which is the minutes of the meeting of secretaries and logistics of divisions and independent regiments on the 15th of December 1976. And you go on to say, according to Son Sen's analysis, the constant petty theft plaguing DK as well as mysterious phenomena, such as defecating in pathways and knocking on doors at night, were all part of a vast counter-revolutionary plot. You refer to two other military minutes, E3-798, a minutes of the meeting of secretaries and deputy secretaries of the divisions and independent regiments on the 30th of August 1976, and the minutes of the same sort of meeting on the 19th of September 1976. Now my question is this, again, please don't veer into opinion, and it's a very tight question. From your interviews and direct contact you had with interviews, did you gather any information such as um, people being killed, I don't know, for breaking a shovel or pinching something, or matters of that nature? Yes. Thank you, Mr. President. That concludes this section, and I hope that that's a convenient point of which to adjourn. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. President.
ពុទ្ធព្រះអង្គកលៃសម្រាប់នៅពុទ្ធព្រះចាំសម្រាប់ <cười> សាមណាការនៅក្នុងបទបសាមណាការនេះវិញនៅរសៀលនេះបានមុនមកមួយ